Hi everyone. This is lecture 28. This is the first of three lectures on the urinary system. <clears throat> and in this lecture, we're just going to cover the overview of the uh, uh, gross anatomy of the urinary system. Uh, I've kind of simplified it for this semester and took out a lot of the excess uh, anatomy, but we'll talk about mostly the microanatomy. So in this lecture, we'll talk about the basic functions, general structures of the kidney, uh, and the urinary system. But we're going to concentrate more on the nephron. Okay. So the urinary system is composed of the pair of kidneys and the urinary tract. And so the kidney has various functions, such as the removal of metabolic waste, fluid and electrolyte balance, acid-base balance, maintenance of blood pressure, regulation of erythropoiesis, as well as detoxification, the activation of vitamin D, and gluconeogenesis. So the kidney has many important functions than just removing metabolic waste. And so in, in these three lectures, starting from the next lecture, we'll talk more about the kidney function. So here is just the, the uh, location of the kidney, the retroperitoneal uh, toward your back. In the posterior view, they're very close to your back. Uh, the urinary tract has uh, just a few structures, a pair of ureters that carries urine from the kidney, urinary bladder that stores the urine, and the urethra that expels urine from the body. Okay. And to hear the, the various structures and their location, ureter, urinary bladder, and urethra. Uh, it will talk a little bit about the structure of kidneys, not too much of the external and internal, and internal anatomy, as you're going to get this most of the lab. Uh, the hilum is the opening for the entrance and exit of the renal artery, vein, and uh, nerves, and ureter. And this opens into a space called the renal sinus, which is lined by the capsule ur and urine draining structures, as well as adipose tissue. So here's the hilum. You can see we have the blood vessel and the ureter leave. And here's showing the renal sinus lined with adipose. Okay. The internal anatomy of the kidneys has three regions, the renal cortex, the renal medulla, and the renal pelvis. So if you took me for 203, I told you that the terms cortex and medulla will come back frequently in the SCB 204. And here's another example of this. So I made a table here. Uh, talking about the different regions and a brief description of each. The renal cortex is the outer layer containing the urine forming structures. The renal medulla is the middle layer containing the urine forming structures. And the renal pelvis drains the urine from the cortex and medulla. So these are the three major uh, internal regions of the kidney. And here are they located in this diagram. You have the outer renal cortex, the inner renal medulla, and the deep renal pelvis. In addition, the internal anatomy of the kidney also has renal columns and renal pyramids. The renal columns are the extensions of the renal cortex that pass through the renal medulla toward the renal pelvis, while the pyramids are parallel bundles of small tubes within the renal medulla separated by the renal columns. So in this picture here, we see the renal columns that extend from the cortex into the medulla. And then we have the renal pyramids, these triangular shaped regions of the medulla. And most of all, uh, the, the kidney is formed by these functional units called nephrons. These are microscopic filtering structures of the renal cortex and renal medulla. And so this is the actual functional units that will do the filtering and uh, formation they're in. And so here's an example of a nephron here. And these nephrons here, you can see most of it is in the cortex that dive deep into the medulla. Now, the nephrons are composed of structures called renal corpuscles and renal tubules uh, that form the nephrons. The renal corpuscles uh, and renal tubules are mostly in the cortex. Only renal tubule dips deep into the renal medulla. Okay, so here's the various structures, the renal corpuscle, the renal tubule, 
uh, <clears throat> that dive deep into the medulla. And you can see that they dive deep into the renal pyramid of the renal medulla. The internal anatomy of the kidneys also the close of the papilla. These are the openings of the renal pyramids that will drain uh, into the uh, uh, minor calyx. I like little pipes. So you can see here, uh, here's the renal pyramid, and you see the renal papilla where the urine will drain out into the minor calyx. And urine from several minor calyxes drain into larger mi major calyxes. And so two or three major calluses drain into the renal pelvis. So here's the renal pelvis. And you can see the, uh, the major calyx drains several minor calluses. And of course, these drain into the uh, ureter. Okay. So from the renal pelvis drains urine into the ureters, which goes to the storage organ, urinary bladder, and when expelled, goes to the urethra. So the ureters transports urine from the kidneys to the urinary bladder, and they're composed of transitional epithelium. Okay, and this is showing the, the location of the ureters as they drain into the urinary bladder. Uh, the urinary bladder is a hollow distensible organ that collapses when empty. Okay, uh, it can hold 700 800 milliliters of urine, and it also includes transitional epithelium. And this is usually the one example that we provided in SCB-203 when we're discussing transitional epithelium. Okay. So here's the urinary bladder. There are other structures uh, within the kidney, uh, such as the trigone, uh, a, 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 as a triangular region, and the posterior corners have the ure ureteral openings from the ureters, and they have little flaps that prevent the backflow of urine. At the apex of the trigone, it contains the internal urethral orifice, where it drains into the urethra. Okay. So the trigone has the corners of the urethral openings, and the internal urethral sphincter is the other apex of the triangle. The, the urine bladder uh, is different in the different sexes. In the males is anterior to the rectum. In males, it's anterior to the vagina and inferior to the uterus. Okay, and so the, here's the two the comparisons of the two in the male and the female pelvis. And so you, from this picture, you can tell why that uh, a woman who's expecting well, has the sensation of having to urinate frequently because the, the, the fetus is pushing against, uh, or the, uh, the, uterus is, uh, the uterus is pushing against, the, the fetus and the uterus is pushing against the urinary bladder. The urethra drains urine from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body, okay, and uh, it begins at the internal urethral orifice and it's surrounded by the internal urinary sphincter. And normally, the sphincter remains closed until urine is eliminated. Okay, so here's the urethra and the internal urethral sphincter. The urethra itself, uh, well, it, it, the sphincter is formed from skeletal muscle and is under voluntary control. So the external urethral sphincter is under voluntary control. So here's the external urethral sphincter. So we have voluntary conscious control to allow the urine to uh, relieve ourselves. Urethra itself is also different in the different uh, sexes. In females, it's shorter. It opens up the external urethral orifice between the vagina and the clitoris and serves only for the passage of the urine. Okay, so it's here very sharp in the female and close to the external urethral orifice. The males, it's longer. It consists of three regions that transport both urine and semen. So it's combined the, the urinary system and the reproductive system. The prostatic urethra passes through the prostate gland. The membranous urethra is the shortest segment from there. And the sponge urethra passes through the penis and, the, and is the longest segment. And so here are the three regions, the prostatic urethra, the membranous urethra, and then, then the spongy urethra. And then, of course, the opening is also the external urethral orifice. Uh, uh, as you might expect, a, a considerable amount of the uh, cardiac output goes to the kidneys, about one-fourth 
25% or about 1200 milliliters per minute of the cardiac, but uh, it goes to the kidneys. Okay. Uh, we'll spend a, a good portion of time discussing the kidney microanatomy and discussing the nephrons because in the subsequent lectures, we're going to be discussing the actions and functions of the nephrons and the collecting system. So the nephrons themselves filters the blood and modifies the fluid that passes through the renal tubule. So much like the digestive system, what enters or begins at the uh, beginning of the nephron is much different from uh, what exits. So the renal corpuscle filters the blood. The renal corpuscle composed of the glomerulus and the, and the glomerular capsule, also known as Bowman's capsule. The glomerulus is a group of fenestrated capillaries. If you're a fenestrated capillary, so they have, they're very porous. So this diagram is showing the glomerulus and it's surrounded by the glomerular capsule and the entire structure is the renal corpuscle. Okay. The capsule itself is composed of two layers, an outer parietal layer and an inner visceral layer. Okay. And histologically, they're different. The parietal layer is composed of simple squamous epithelium and the visceral layers are modified epithelial cells called podocytes that wrap around the glomerular capillaries. And these podocytes actually form the slits for the filtration. Okay. So this shows the parietal layer and the visceral layer. Okay. Uh, and uh, the podocytes uh, form these little uh, filtration slits with their little feet. And so that the filtr filtrate passes through or between uh, where the slits are. So the podocytes, from their name, podo, have foot processes or pedicels forming the filtration slits. Uh, the capsular space is that open area between the parietal and visceral layers. So here is the capsular space. Okay. And you see the pedicels or foot processes and forming the filtration slits between them. So blood is filtered through the filtration slits. Okay. And once the fluid leaves the glomerular capillaries, we call, now call it the filtrate. And then the filtrate enters the capsular space and into the renal tubule. Okay. So here's the proximal tubule and a, a, a blood entering it gets filtered and it forms a filtrate and into the tubule. <clears throat> the renal tubule itself has three regions. There's a proximal tubule, nephron loop or loop of Henle, and a distal tubule. Okay, so in this little illustration, we have the renal carpuscle that, form, that follows with the proximal tubule the nephron loop, and the distal tubule. Okay. The proximal tubule is the longest segment. It's formed of simple cuboidal epithelium. It, it, the tubule, proximal tubule has both a convoluted and straight areas and contains microvilli forming a brush border. Okay, so with a brush border, you, might, you can expect that absorption is going to occur here. Okay, and this is what we mean we have a coiled part and we have a straight part. Now, the nef le nephron loop or loop of Henle is the only part that dips into the renal medulla. There's a descending limb with simple squamous epithelium called a thin descending limb, and it continues at the bend of the loop. Okay, here's the thin descending limb of the nephron loop. The ascending limb is also a simple cuboidal epithelium, but this forms a thick ascending limb. Okay. So here's the thick ascending limb, okay, and it has no microvilli, so you can expect that probably reabsorption is not a very big function. Now the question is, why is it thicker? Well, it's thicker because there's many more mitochondria in the thick ascending loop. More mitochondria, that means there's going to be more uh, devotion to ATP, suggesting there's more ATP-dependent processes occurring in the thick ascending limb, as we will see. The final segment is the distal tubule. And again, just like the proximal tubule, there's both a convoluted and straight region. And it's composed of simple cuboidal epithelium. Again, there's no brush border. 
and very, very few microvilli. So here I made a little table uh, comparing the different parts of the renal tubule. Okay, the proximal tube is longest, composed of simple cuboid epithelium. It has both convoluted straight regions and contains the brush border. The nephron loop is composed of a thin descending limb with simple squamous epithelium, which continues at the bend, as well as a thin ascending limb with simple cuboid epithelium. Finally, the distal tubule has both convoluted and straight regions like the proximal tubule, and it's composed of simple cuboid epithelium. However, there's no brush border. So there's very distinctive regions in each part of the renal tubule. Another specialized area is called the juxta glomerular apparatus, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. It's composed of an area called the macula densa and juxta glomerular cell, often abbreviated JC. The macula densa are a group of cells between the ascending limb and distal tubule. Now, these uh, contact modified smooth muscle cells called juxta glomerular cells that are between the afferent and efferent arterioles. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> the arterioles that enter and exit the glomerulus include the uh, afferent arteriole that enters the glomerulus and the efferent arteriole that exits the glomerulus. And here we see the uh, modified smooth muscles called the juxtal glomerular cells between the efferent and afferent arterioles and the macula densa that associates them and that are part of the distal tubule. Now, what's the point, importance of the juxta glomerular apparatus? Well, it functions in blood pressure, regulation of blood pressure, and also glomerular filtration rate. Filtration rate. We'll talk more about these uh, in the next lecture. Finally, we have the collecting system, which will further modify the filtrate. <clears throat> so here we see the collecting system. <clears throat> that have entrances from the nephrons. It's composed of a cortical collecting duct and the medullary collecting system. Okay, so they extend through the uh, cortex and the medulla. So first is the cortical collecting duct, followed by the medulla medullary collecting duct. The cortical collecting duct drains several distal tubules in the renal cortex, and it's composed of simple cuboidal epithelium. Okay, so here they are right here. Very few microvilli. The medullary collecting ducts uh, are, are, are extensions from the cortical collecting ducts. And these well, uh, several of these medullary collecting ducts empty the filtrate into the large papillary duct. And they're composed of low columnar epithelium. Okay. And so you can see here the medullary collecting duct joining to form the papillary collecting duct. Finally, the filtrate reaching the end of the papillary duct is now what we call urine. And it exits through the, uh, re uh, the uh, renal papilla of the renal pyramid into the minor calyx. Okay, so here's the minor calyx. Here's the, the papilla as the urine is formed. And you can see there are extensions from the collecting ducts that uh, the filtrate enters from the nephrons. Now, there are two different types of nephrons, cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. You might have seen these in the earlier figures, and these are going to play an important role in, in kidney function, and we'll talk about these in later, later lectures, but we're now we're just going to introduce them to you so that when we mention them later, you'll know already what they are. Okay, most of the nephrons are called cortical nephrons. 80% of nephrons are these. And the renal corpuscles are in the outer renal cortex with short nephron loops. And surrounding them are peritubular capillaries that supply blood to the nephron loops via the interstitial fluid. So here are the uh, uh, cortical nephrons surrounded by the peritubular capillaries. And these supply uh, uh, the blood that, uh, 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 that from the uh, efferent arterioles. Okay. And you can see the blood supply from the kidney entering the afferent arteriole. The other type of nephrons are called the juxtamedullary nephrons, and they're less numerous. And the renal corpuscle is closer to the boundary between the renal cortex and renal medulla, so they're much deeper. 
but they also have longer nephrons that go deep into the renal medulla. Okay, so these are going to be important for concentrating the urine. And you can see here the uh, juxtamedullary nephrons have much longer uh, loop of Henle that extend deep into the renal medulla. And these juxtamedullary neurons are surrounded by the vasorecta capillaries from the efferent arterial that surrounds the loop. Okay, so from the efferent arterial, these vasorecta surround these nephron loops of the juxtamedullary nephron, and these are going to play an important role in concentrating the urine in these juxtamedullary nephrons. Okay, so now you have a very good background to, for us to discuss the urinary function, uh, especially in, as we talk about the nephrons in the next lecture. Okay? So this is the end of uh, this lecture 28.